Hello. Um, I am in social isolation. And when you have a pandemic on your hands, it makes you think back to other pandemics in the past. I'm thinking specifically of the bubonic plague and how people responded. And, well, we have historical records and we have literature. And this got me to go and find my copy of Boccaccio's Decameron, which tells a story of 10 people in social isolation. They're practicing social distancing because of a pandemic, not the coronavirus, but the bubonic plague. And, well, I thought I'd read some of this. So, shall we get started? So, here we go. Whenever, fairest ladies, I pause to consider how compassionate you are by nature, I invariably become aware that the present work will seem to you to possess an irksome and ponderous opening, for it carries at its head the painful memory of the deadly havoc wrought by recent plague, which brought so much heartache and misery to those who witnessed and had experienced it. But I do not want you to be deterred for this reason from my reading any further on the assumption that you are to be subjected, as you read, to an endless torrent of tears and sobbing, you will be affected no differently by this grim beginning than walkers confronted by a steep or rugged hill, beyond which there lies a beautiful and delectable plain. The degree of pleasure they derive from the latter will correspond directly to the difficulty of the climb and the recent, and the descent, sorry, and just as the end of mirth is heaviness, so sorrows are dispersed by the advent of joy. So Boccaccio's writing for people who would remember the plague quite personally. He's not writing for us in the 21st century. He's writing for people in the 14th century. And he's just saying, you know, a lot of bad memories, but let's just get past that and enjoy ourselves a little bit. So. Let's get past it now. This brief unpleasantness, I call it brief inasmuch as it contained within few words, is quickly followed by the sweetness and the pleasure which I've already promised you, and which, unless you were told in advance, you would not perhaps be expecting to find after such a beginning as this. Believe me, if I could decently have taken you whither I desired um, by some other route rather than along the path so difficult as this, I would gladly have done so. But since it is impossible without this memoir to show the origin of the events you will read about later, I really have no alternative but to address myself to, this, to its composition. So, basically what he's saying is, yeah, it was really, really, really bad. But bear with us. We'll get to some fun stuff. I say then that the sum of 1,348 years had elapsed since the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God, when the noble city of Florence, which for its great beauty excels all others in Italy, was visited by the deadly pestilence. This would be the plague. Some say that it descended upon the human race through the influence of heavenly bodies, others that it was punishment signifying God's righteous angry anger at our iniquitous way of life. But whatever its cause, it had originated some years earlier in the East, where it had claimed countless lives before it unhappily spread westward, growing in strength, as if as it swept relentlessly on from one place to the next. Now, we know now that the plague was carried by a bacteria, carried by fleas, carried by rats. Boccaccio doesn't know this. So the origins of the plague are very mysterious. All they know is it came and it killed. So, let's go on. In the face of its onrush, all wisdom and ingenuity of man were unavailing. Large quantities of refuse were cleared out of the city by officials specially appointed for the purpose. All sick persons were forbidden entry, and numerous instructions were issued for safeguarding the people's health, but all to no avail. Nor were the countless petitions humbly directed to God by, his, by the pious, whether by means of formal processions or in all other ways, any less effectual, any less ineffectual. For in the early spring of the year we have mentioned, the plague began in a terrifying and extraordinary manner to make its disastrous effects apparent. It did not take the form it had assumed in the East, 
where it had, where if anyone bled from the nose, it was an obvious portent of certain death. On the contrary, its earliest symptoms in men and women alike was the appearance of certain swellings in the groins or armpits, some of which were egg-shaped, while others were roughly the size of the common apple. Now, a couple things here. I probably should have stopped a little earlier. You can see that people are doing the same things to protect themselves then that they were now. They're cleaning up. They're sanitizing their cities. Um, they knew that there was a correlation between, you know, the horse um, poop that would build up in the streets and other feces and disease. So they're clearing it away. They're doing everything they can to make the city sanit um, sanitized. They're impo imposing, um, basically they're shutting the borders to the city. They're saying nobody comes in, nobody comes out as a way to try to keep the disease out. But it's not really working because in, like in so many of these cases, unless you know well ahead of time it's coming, by the time you do these things, well, it's already in the city. So let's go on with the um, condition. Now, they're talking about swellings in the groins and armpits, some to the size of a common apple. Well, apples were smaller back then. I want to start with that. But still, an egg-sized swelling in the groin or armpits, that's going to hurt. Basically what happened is the bacteria that causes the plague has infected the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes run through the body. It's just most noticeable where the lymph nodes come closest to the surface, like as in the groin, the neck, the armpits. Um, so you see the swelling much more than, believe me, there's swelling inside the body, but that would not be as visible, especially to people without MRI machines or CAT scans. Um, but anyway, shall we go on? Sometimes the swellings were large, sometimes not so large, and they were referred to by the populace as, and I'm not sure how the spell pronounces, Gevok, Gevokolioli? Hmm. And from two areas already mentioned, this deadly, Gevokolioli? Gevokiolo? Hmm. I'm sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, would begin to spread, and within a short time, it would appear at random all over the body. Later on, the symptoms of the disease changed, and many people began to find dark blotches and bruises on their arms, thighs, and other parts of their body, sometimes large and few in number, at other times tiny and closely spaced. These, to anyone unfortunate enough to contract them, were just as infallible a sign that he would die as the Gavi... I don't know how to pronounce it. Basically, the egg-shaped bumps in your um, groin and armpits it had been earlier, and indeed, it still was. Against these maladies, it seemed that all advice of physicians and all the power of medicine were profitless and unavailing. Perhaps the nature of the illness was such that it allowed no remedy, or perhaps those people who were treating the illness, whose numbers had increased enormously because the ranks of qualified were invaded by people, both men and women, who had never received any training in medicine being ignorant of its causes, were not prescribing the appropriate cure. At all events, few of those who caught it ever recovered, and in most cases, death occurred within three days from the appearance of the symptoms we have described. Some people dying more rapidly than others, the majority without any fever or other complications. So this is actually a pretty precise description of the effects of this disease. Now, today, if you come in contact with the plague, what they do is they pump you full of antibiotics and you get better. It's that simple. Uh, the only people who die of the plague are people who are exposed to it by a squirrel and they're like on a three day backpacking trip and they're two days away from medical help. And so the plague kills them before they can get back to civilization. But basically if you're alive, when you reach the hospital, they pump you full of antibiotics, the antibiotics kill the bacteria and you very quickly re recover. So, you know, we have tools that they did not. But anyway, um, shall we go on? But what made this pestilence even more severe was that whenever those suffering from it mixed with people who were still unaffected, it would rush upon these with the speed of a fire racing through dry or oily substance that perhaps that had happened to come within its reach. Nor was this full extent of its evil, for not only did it infect healthy persons who conversed or had any dealings with the sick, making them ill or visiting an equally horrible death upon them, but it also seemed to transfer the sickness to anyone touching the clothes or other objects which had been handled or used by the victims. Now, it's not like with the coronavirus where you know a person can sneeze on a table and another person puts their hands on the table and rubs their eyes. In this case, 
It's just simply because everybody had fleas back then. Fleas were a fact of life. Fleas just were a major problem in Europe. And so handling the clothes, well, there's a flea, you know, the person died and there are some hungry fleas in his clothes and, you know, you're handling it and those fleas get on you and they bite you and they spread the plague to you. So, yeah, I mean, the clothes of another person could kill you. But let's get back to it. It is a remarkable story that I have to relate, and were it not for the fact that I am one of many people who saw it with their own eyes, I would scarcely dare to believe it, let alone commit it to paper, even though I had heard it from a person whose word I could trust. The plague I have been describing was so contagious, a nature that very often it visibly did more than simply pass from one person to another. In other words, whenever an animal or other than a human being touched anything belonging to a person who had been stricken or exterminated by the disease, it not only caught the sickness, but died from it almost at once. To all of this, as I have just said, my own eyes bore witness, or on more than one occasion. One day, for instance, the rags of a pauper who had died from the disease were thrown into the street, where they attracted the attention of two pigs. In their wanted fashion, the pigs, first of all, gave the rags a thorough mauling with their snouts, after which they took them between their teeth and shook them against their cheeks. And within a short time, they began to writhe as though they had been poisoned. Then they both dropped dead to the ground, spread eagle upon the rags that had brought about their undoing. Um, you may have seen this. You know, a flea. The thing about the, um, the plague bacteria is that it clogs the gut of the flea. That's one of the reasons why it spreads so fast. Fleas don't need to feed that often. They can go for a month between meals. But what happens is it clogs the gut of the flea, which means the flea starts to starve. And when you're starving, you try to eat anything. So basically the flea goes from person to person, trying to bite, trying to feed, and in desperation will go after animals that a flea would normally not inhabit and bite them. It's so desperate to feed because it's starving. Now. Does that mean a pig usually dies within hours? Well, for all we know, that pig had already been bitten. And, you know, these were just happened to be the rags that it was after at the time when it was affected. Um, I'll go on. These things and many others of a similar or even worse nature caused various fears and fantasies to take root in the minds of those who were still alive and well. And almost without exception, they took a single and very inhumane, uh, very inhuman precaution, namely to avoid or run away from the sick and their belongings, by which means they all sought that their own health would be preserved. Some people were of the opinion that a sober and abstin abstemious um, mode of living considerably reduced the risk of infection. They therefore formed themselves into groups and lived in isolation from everyone else, having withdrawn to, the, to a comfortable abode where there were no sick persons. They locked themselves in and settled there, and settled down to a peaceable existence, consuming moderate quantities of delicate foods and precise and precious wines and avoiding all excesses. They refrained from speaking to outsiders, refused to receive news of the dead or the sick, and entertained themselves with music and whatever other amusements they were able to devise. Social distancing, isn't it? That is social distancing, if I ever heard it. And it was a thing back then, too. Others took the opposite view and maintained that an infallible way of warding off this appalling evil was to drink heavily, enjoy life to the full, go around singing and merrymaking, gratifying all of one's cravings whenever the opportunity offered, and shrug the whole thing off as one enormous joke. And we've seen some of that, too. Um, moreover, they practiced what they preached to the best of their ability, for they would visit one tavern after another, drinking all day and night to a moderate excess, and alternatively, and this was um, their more frequent custom, they would do their drinking in various private houses, but only in the ones where the conversation was restricted to subjects that were pr pleasant or entertaining. Such places were easy to find for people behaved as though their days were numbered and treated their belongings and their own persons with equal abandon. Hence, most houses had become common property, and any passing stranger could make himself at home as naturally as though he were the rightful owner. But for all their riotous manner of living, these people always took good care to avoid any contact with the sick. We see some of that too. You know, the schools have closed, and so 
students head to the bars. And people wonder, well, what are you doing? The whole reason we closed the schools was to keep you isolated from people who might be sick. And what are people doing? They're going and congregating in places to have fun. Well, this is human nature. It's human nature now, and it was human nature then. They're not looking for sick people. Believe me, if somebody comes in here hacking a lung out, they're going to leave that bar. But this is human nature. And human nature has not changed appreciably in 700 years. Or is it 800 years? Eh, I guess it's closer to 800 years. Anyway. In the face of such affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man had virtually broken down and been um, extinguished in our city. For like everybody else, those ministers and executors of the laws who were not either dead or ill were left with few subordinates that they were unable to discharge any of their duties. Hence, everyone was free to behave as he pleased. There were many other people who steered a middle course between the two already mentioned, neither restricting their diet to the same degree as the first group, nor indulging so freely as the second in drinking and other forms of wantonness, but simply doing no more than satisfying their appetite. Instead of incarcerating themselves, these people moved about freely, holding, their hands, uh, holding in their hands a posy of flowers or fragrant herbs or one of a wide range of spices which they applied at frequent intervals to their nostrils, thinking it an excellent idea to fortify the brain with smells of the particular sort, for the stench of dead bodies, sickness, and medicines seem to fill and pollute the whole of the atmosphere. So, a lot of people just tried to carry on their lives as normal. You know, they would do, they would take some precautions. Um, they didn't have hand sanitizer, but they would use herbs and scented stuff that they thought the smell would keep the plague away. Um, there's no real scientific studies to determine whether they did or not. You know, it's hard to tell how a flea would respond to a handful of posies or something like that. But, you know, they're basically trying to carry on their lives, taking precautions, but more or less trying to live their lives as normal, like so many people today. Okay, although there was also another purpose, and the fact is there was just so many dead bodies around it. What a stunk to high heaven. Anyway, some people pursuing what was possibly the safer alternative called callously maintained that there was no better or more efficacious remedy against a plague than to run away from it. Swayed by this argument and sparing no thought for anyone but themselves, large numbers of men and women abandoned their city, their homes and their relatives, their estates and their belongings, and headed for the countryside, either in Florentine territory or, better still, abroad. It was as though they imagined that the wrath of God would not unleash this plague against men for their iniquitous, irrespective uh, for their iniquities, irrespective of where they happened to be, but would only be roused against those who found themselves within the city walls, or possibly they assumed that the whole of the population would be exterminated and that the city's last hour had come. Of the people who held these various opinions, not all of them died, nor, however, did all survive. On the contrary, many of each different persuasion fell ill here and there and everywhere, and having themselves, when they were fit and well, set an example to those who were yet to, unaffected, they languished away with virtually no one to nurse them. It was not merely a question of one citizen avoiding another, or a people almost invariably neglecting their neighbors and rarely or never visiting their relatives, addressing them only from a distance. This scourge had implanted so great a terror in the hearts of men and women that brothers abandoned brothers, uncles their nephews, sisters their brothers, and in many cases wives deserted their husbands. But even worse, and almost incredible, was the fact that fathers and mothers refused to nurse or assist their own children as though they did not belong to them. Hence the countless numbers fell, numbers of people who fell ill, both male and female, were entirely dependent upon either the charity of friends, who were few and far between, or of the greed of servants who remained in short supply despite the attraction of high wages out of all proportion to the services they performed. Furthermore, these latter were men and women of coarse intellect, and the majority were unused to such duties, and they did little more than hand things to the, ind to the invalid when asked to do so, or watch over him when he was dying, and in performing this kind of service they frequently lost their lives as well as their earnings. 
as a result of the wholesale desertion of the sick by neighbors, relatives, and friends, and in view of the scarcity of servants, there grew up a practice almost never previously heard of, whereby when a woman fell ill, no matter how gracious or beautiful or gently bred she might be, she raised no objection to being attended by a male servant, whether he was young or not. Nor did she have any scruple about showing him every part of her body as freely as she would have displayed it to a woman, provided that the nature of her infirmity required her to do so. And this explains why those women who recovered were possibly less chaste in the period that followed. We'll see if that happens after the coronavirus. We'll see. Moreover, a great many people who died would perhaps have survived had they received some assistance, and hence... Uh, what with the lack of appropriate means for tending the sick and the virulence of the plague. The number of deaths reported in the city, whether by day or by night, was so enormous that it astonished all who, were, who heard tell of it, say nothing of the people who actually witnessed the carnage. And it was perhaps inevitable that among the citizens who survived, there arose certain customs that were quite contrary to the established tradition. Now, this is something that happened with the bubonic plague. There are people who say that if the bubonic plague had not come through, maybe the Renaissance would not have happened either. It really did cause people to change how they thought about everything. When everything is thrown into turmoil, everything is thrown into question. And when people start questioning things, people start coming up with different ideas. Um, but we'll see. It would be interesting to see how once the coronavirus is a thing of the past, how does it change the way we think about our society? It will be interesting to see. And I don't believe there's any way to predict it, other than to say that, let's just say history repeats itself sometimes. It had once been customary, as it is again nowadays, for the women relatives and neighbors of a dead man to assemble in his house in order to mourn in the company of the women who had been closest to him. Moreover, his kinfolks would forgather in front of this house along with his neighbors and various other citizens. And there would be a contingent of priests whose numbers varied according to the quality of the deceased. His body would be taken thence to the church in which he had wanted to be buried, being borne on the shoulders of his peers amidst the funeral pomp of candles and dirges, but at, as the ferocity of the plague began to mount, this practice all but disappeared entirely and was replaced by different customs. We see this even today. Um, as Kenny Rogers died just recently, and they're going to have a very, very small funeral. And people watching it online. And one of the big reasons is the plague. Customs are changing, especially when regarding the dead. Okay, so... But as the ferocity of the plague began to mount, the practice all but disappeared entirely and was replaced by different costumes. For not only did people die without having many women about them, but a great number departed this life without anyone at all to witness their going. Few indeed were those to whom the lamentations and bitter tears of their relatives were accorded. On the contrary, more often than not, bereavement was a signal, was a, the signal for laughter and witticism and general jollification, the art of which the women having, for the most part, suppressed their feminine concern for the salvation of the souls of the dead, had learned perfection. Moreover, it was rare for the bodies of the dead to be accompanied by more than ten or twelve mourners to the church, nor were they borne on the shoulders of the worthy, honest citizens, but by a kind of grave-digging fraternity newly come into being and drawn from the lower orders of society. These people assumed the title of sexton and demanded a fat fee for their services which consisted of taking up the coffin and hauling it swiftly away, not to the church specif specified by the dead man in his will, but usually to the nearest at hand. They would be preceded by a group of four to six clerks, who between them carried one or two candles at most, and sometimes none at all. Nor did the priest go to the trouble of pronouncing solemn and lengthy funeral rites, but with the aid of those so-called sextons, they hastily lowered the body into the nearest empty grave they could find. As for the common people in large proportion of the bourgeoisie, they presented a much more pathetic spectacle, for the majority of them were constrained either by their poverty or the hope of survival. To remain in their houses, being confined to their own parts of the city, they fell ill daily in their thousands, and since they had no one 
to assist them or attend to their needs, they inevitably perished, almost without exception. Many dropped dead in open streets, both by day and night, whilst a great many others, though dying in their own houses, drew their neighbor's attention to the fact that they more by the smell of their rotting corpses than by any other means. And what with these and the others who were dying all over the city, bodies were here and there and everywhere. Whenever people died, their neighbors nearly always followed a single set routine, prompted as much by their fear of being contaminated by the decaying corpses as by the charitable feelings that they may have entertained towards the deceased, either on their own or with the assistance of bearers whenever these were to be had. They extracted the bodies of the dead from their houses and left them lying outside in the front doors, where anyone going about the streets, especially in the early morning, could have observed countless numbers of them, funeral bearers, um, would be set up, would be sent for them, upon which the dead were taken away, though there were some who, for lack of bearers, were carried off on plain boards. It was by no means rare for more than one of these bearers to be seen with two or three bodies upon it at a time. On the contrary, many were seen to contain a husband and a wife, two or three, but, two or three brothers and sisters, a father and son, and some other pair of close relatives, and times without number it happened that two priests would be on their way to bury someone holding a cross before them only to find that the bearers carrying three or four additional bearers would fall in behind them not that whereas the priests had had thought that they only there were they left excuse me <laughs> that they had only one burial to attend to they in fact had six or seven and sometimes more even in these circumstances however there were no tears for the candles tears or candles or mourners to honor the dead in fact no more respected was no more respect was accorded the dead people than would nowadays be shown towards dead goats for it was quite apparent that the one thing which in normal times no wise men had ever learned to accept with patient resignation even though it struck so seldom and unobtrusively had now been brought home to the feeble-minded as well but the scale of the calamity caused them to regard it with indifference. Such was the multitude of corpses, of which further consignments were arriving every day and almost by the hour at each of the churches, that there was not suffi sufficient consecrated ground for them to be buried in, especially if each was to have his own plot in accordance with the long-established customs. So when all of the graves were full, huge trenches were excavated in the churchyards, into which new arrivals were placed in their hundreds, stowed tier upon tier, like ship's cargo, each layer of corpses being covered over with a thin layer of soil till the trench was finally to the top. But rather than describe in elaborate detail the calamities we experienced in the city at the time, I must mention that whilst an ill wind was blowing through Florence itself, the surrounding region was no less badly affected. In the fortified towns, conditions were similar to those of the city, um, in the city on a minor scale. But in the scattered hamlets and the countryside proper, the poor unfortunate peasants and their family had no physics, physicians or servants whatever to assist them, and collapsed by the wayside in their fields and in their cottages at all hours of day and night, dying more like animals than human beings. Like the townspeople, they too grew apoplectic or apathetic in their ways, disregarded their affairs, neglected their possessions. Moreover, they all behaved as though each day was to be their last. And far from making provisions for the future by tilling their lands, tending their flocks, and adding to their previous labors, they tried in every way they could think to, uh, to squander the assets they already possessed. Thus, it came about that oxen, asses, sheep, goats, chickens, and even dogs, for all their deep fidelity to man, were driven away and allowed to roam freely through the fields, where the crops lay abandoned and had not even been reaped, let alone gathered in. And after a whole day's feasting, many of the animals, as though possessing the power of reason, would return, glutted to the, in the evening to their own quarters, without any shepherd to guide them. But let us leave the countryside and return to the city. What more remains to be said, except that the cruelty of heaven, and possibly, in some measure, also that of man, was so immense and so devastating that, that between March and July of the year in question, 
what with the fury of the pestilence and the fact that so many of the sick were inadequately cared for or abandoned in their hour of need because of the, the healthy were too terrified to approach them, it is reliably thought that over a hundred thousand human lives were extinguished within the walls of the city of Florence. Yet before this lethal catastrophe fell upon the city, it is doubtful whether anyone would have guessed it contained so many inhabitants. Basically, he's saying that so many people died in Florence that they had to rethink because like, whoa, more people were dead than we even knew had lived here. That's a lot of dead people. And that tells you quite a bit about it. I mean, some estimates are one out of every three people in Europe died of the plague. One out of three is incredible. I mean, with the coronavirus kind of worst case scenario, we're looking at 2%. Now, 2% would be, you know, for a country of 300 million. Well, you do the math. I think I'm getting about, um, God, 300 million, 2% of 300 million, and we get about 6 million. 6 million people who die at 2%. So much greater numbers, even though it's a lower you know, percentage because our population is so much greater. Let's hope that does not happen. Okay, so shall we go on? Ah, how great a number of splendid palaces, fine houses and noble dwellings, once filled with retainers, with lords and with ladies, were bereft of all who had lived there, down to the tiniest child. How numerous were the famous families, the vast estates, the noble fortunes that were seen to be left without a rightful successor. How many gallant gentlemen, fair ladies, and sprightly youth who would have been judged hale and hearty by Galen, Hippocrates, and Aeschylus. I always forget how to pronounce his name. These are um, ancient physicians, by the way. Um, I'm not sure how ancient they all are, but I know that some of them are ancient. Um, to say nothing of others, having breakfasted in the morning with their kinfolks, acquainted, acquaintances and friends, supped that evening with their ancestors in the next world. So, like, literally, you're healthy as can be. A physician would say you're in perfect health at breakfast, and you're dead by dinner time. Um, whoops. There goes, there goes my microphone. The more I reflect upon this misery, the deeper my sense of personal sorrow. Hence, I shall refrain from describing those aspects which can suitably be omitted, and proceed to inform you that these were the conditions prevailing in our city, which was by now almost emptied of its inhabitants, when one Tuesday morning, or so I was told by a person who was word I can be trusted, seven young ladies were to be found in the venerable church of Santa Maria Novella, which was otherwise almost deserted. They had been attending divine service, and were dressed in mournful attire appropriate to the times. Each was a friend, a neighbor, or a relative of the other, of the other six. None was older than 27 or younger than 18, and all were intelligent, gently bred, um, fair to look upon, graceful in bearing, and charmingly unaffected. I could tell you their actual names, but refrain from doing so for, good, for a good reason, namely, that I would not want any of them to feel embarrassed at any time in the future on account of the ensuing stories, all of which they either listened to or narrated themselves. For nowadays, laws relating to pleasure are somewhat restrictive, whereas at that time, for the reasons indicated above, they were exceptionally lax, not only for ladies of their own age, but also for much older women, especially, um, or sorry, Besides, I have no wish to supply envious tongues ever ready to censor a laudable way of life with a chance to dis besmirch the good name of these worthy ladies with their lewd and filthy gossip. Therefore, so that we may perceive distinctly that each of them had to say, I purposely refer to them by names which are either wholly or partially appropriate to the qualities of each. The first of them, who was also the eldest, we shall call Pampinea. The second, Fiametta, Philomena the third, and the fourth, Emilia. Then we shall name the fifth, Loretta, and the sixth, Nephile. I'm probably pronouncing that one wrong. While the last, not without reason, we shall give the name Eliza. Without prior agreement, but simply by chance, these seven ladies found themselves sitting more or less in a circle in one part of the church reciting their um, paternosters, um, eventually, they left off 
and heaved a great many sighs, after which they began to talk among themselves on various different aspects of the time through which they were passing. But after a little while, they all fell silent, except Pampanea, who said, Dear ladies, you will often have heard it affirmed, as I have, that no man does injury to another in exercising his lawful rights. Every person born in this world has a natural right to sustain, persevere, and defend the, his own life to the best of his ability. A right so freely acknowledged that men have sometimes killed others in self-defense and no blame whatever has attached to their actions. Now, if this is permitted by laws upon whose prompt of application all moral creatures depend for their well-being, how can it possibly be wrong, seeing that it harms no one for us or anyone else to do all in our powers to preserve our lives. If I pause to consider what we have been doing this morning and what we have done on several mornings in the past, if I reflect on the nature of the su and subject of our conversation, I realize, just as you all must realize, that each of us is apprehensive on her own account and does not surprise me in the least. But what does greatly surprise me, seeing that each of us is has the natural feelings of a woman, is that we do nothing to requisite ourselves against a thing to, of which we are all so justly afraid. It's like, what are we doing? We need to do something. Everybody's dropping around, around us. We need to do something, basically. Here we linger for no other purpose, or so it seems to me, than to count the number of corpses being taken to burial, or to hear whether the friars of the church, very few of whom are left, chant their offices at appropriate hours, or to exhibit the quality of quant and quantity of our sorrows by means of clothes we are wearing to all those whom we meet in this place. And if we go outside, we shall see the dead and the sick being carried hither and thither, or we shall see people once condemned to exile by the courts for their misdeeds careering wildly about the streets in open defiance of the law. Well, knowing that those appointed to enforce it are either dead or dying, or else we shall find ourselves at the mercy of the scum of our city, who, having scented our blood, call themselves sextons and go prancing and bustling all over the place, signing bo singing body songs that add insult to our injuries. Moreover, all we ever hear is so-and-so's dead and so-and-so's dying. And if there were anyone left to mourn, the whole place would be filled with the sound of weeping and wailing. And if we return to our homes, what happens? I know not whether your own experience is similar to mine, but my house was once full of servants, and now there is no one left apart from my maid and myself. I am filled with foreboding, and I feel as if every hair in my head is standing on end. Wherever I go in the house, wherever I pause to rest, I seem to be haunted by the shades of the departed, whose faces no longer appear as I remember them, but with strange and horribly twisted expressions that frighten me out of my senses. Accordingly, whether I am here in church, or out in the streets, or sitting at home, I always feel ill at ease, the more so because it seems to me that no one possessing private means and a place to retreat to is left here apart from ourselves. But even if such people are still to be found, they draw no distinction, as I have frequently heard and seen for myself between what is honest and what is dishonest, and provided only that they are prompted by their appetites they will do whatever affords them the greatest pleasure, whether by day or by night, alone or in company. It is not only of lay people that I speak, but also of those enclosed in monasteries who, having convinced themselves that such behavior is suitable for them and is only unbecoming to, in others, have broken the rules of obedience and given themselves over to carnal pleasures, thereby thinking to escape and have less, turned lascivious and desolate. Um, turning over to carnal pleasures, it has been predicted that when this whole thing is over, well, hopefully over, let's just say about nine months from now, there's going to be a lot of babies being born. Because, well, what are you going to do? Um, if this is to be so, and we plainly perceive that it is, what are we doing here? What are we waiting for? Why are we? What are we dreaming about? Why do we lag so far behind all the rest of the citizens in provi providing for our safety? Do we rate ourselves lower than all other women? Or do we suppose that our own lives, unlike those of others, are bound to our bodies by such strong chains that we may ignore all those things which have the power to harm them? 
In that case, we are deluded and mistaken. We have only to recall the names and the conditions of the young men and women who have fallen victim to the cruel pestilence in order to realize clearly foolishness, clearly the foolishness of such notions. And so, lest by pretending to be above such things, or by becoming complacent, we should succumb to that which we might possibly avoid if we so desire. I would think it an excellent idea, though I do not know whether you would agree with me, for us all to go away from this city, just as many others have done before us, and as indeed we are all, um, doing still. We could go and stay together on one of the various country estates, shunning all costs the lewd practices of our fellow citizens, feasting and merrymaking as best we may without in any way overstepping the bounds of what is reasonable. So, her solution? Social distancing. And, well, that's her solution. There we shall hear the birds singing. We shall see fresh green hills and plain fields and corn undulating like the sea and trees at least a thousand different species, and we shall have a clear view of the heavens, which troubled though they are, do not, however, deny us the eternal beauties, so much more fair to look upon than the desolate walls of our city. Moreover, the country air is much more refreshing. The necessities of life such a time as this are more abundant, and there are fewer obstacles to contend with. For although the farm workers are dying there in the same way as in the town people here in Florence, the spectacle is less harrowing inasmuch as the houses and the people are more widely scattered. Besides, unless I am mistaken, we shall not be abandoning anyone by going away from here. On the contrary, we may fairly claim that we are the ones who have been abandoned, for our kinsfolk are either dead or fled and have left us to fend for ourselves in the midst of all this affliction, as though disowning us completely. Hence, no one can reproach us for taking the course I have abdicated, whereas, if we do nothing, we shall inevitably be confronted with distress and mourning, and possibly forfeit our lives into the bargain. Let us therefore do as I suggest, taking our maidservants with us and seeing to dispatch of all things we shall need. We cannot move from place to place, spending one day here and another there, pursuing whatever pleasures and entertainments the present times will afford. In this way of life, we shall continue until such time as we discover, provided we are spared from an early death, the end decreed by heaven for the terrible events you have just remembered. You must remember, after all, that it is no more unseemly for us to go away and thus preserve our own honor than it is for other women to remain here and forfeit theirs. Having listened to Pampanea's suggestion, the other ladies not only applauded it, but were so eager to carry, out the, carry it into effect that they had already begun to work out the details among themselves, as though they wanted to rise from the pews and set out without further ado. But Philomena, being more prudent than the others, said, Pampanea, Pampanea's arguments, ladies, are most convincing, but we should not follow her advice as hastily as you may appear to wish. You must remember that we are all women. Every one of us is sufficiently adult to acknowledge that women, when left to themselves, are not the most rational creatures, and that without supervision of some man or other, their capacity for getting things done is somewhat restricted. We are fickle, quarrelsome, suspicious, cowardly, and easily frightened, and hence I greatly fear that if we have none but ourselves to guide us, our little band will break up much more swiftly and with less credit to ourselves than would otherwise be the case. We would be well advised to resolve this problem before we depart. Now, um, let's just say Boccaccio is writing in the 14th century. Um, he's not exactly a what we would call a woke individual. Um, Yes, let's just say that, you know, this is these are not real women. They are creations of a man who might not have the greatest respect for women's abilities to get things done. So, just bear that in mind. All right. So, then Eliza said, It is certainly true that man is the head of woman. Not exactly a woke individual, that Boccaccio. But I'll go on. Um, and that without a man to guide us, it rarely happens that any enterprise of ours is brought to a worthy conclusion. But where are we to find these men? As we all know, most of our own menfolk, menfolk are dead, and those, that, those few that are still alive are fleeing in scattered little groups 
from that which we too are intent of avoiding, uh, uh, are intent upon avoiding. Yet we cannot very well go away with total strangers, for it is self-preservation and our, is our aim. We must so arrange our affairs that wherever we go for our pleasure and repose, no trouble or scandal should come of it. Whilst the talk of the ladies was proceeding along these lines, there came into the church three young men, in whom neither the horrors of the time nor the loss of friends or relatives nor concern for their own safety had damped in the flames of love, much less extinguished them completely. I have called them young, but none, in fact, was less than 20, 25 years of age. And the first was called Penfilo, the second Philostrato, and the last Dianeo. Each of them was the most agreeable and gently bred, and by way of sweetness, solace, amid all this turmoil, they were seeking to catch a glimpse of their lady loves, all three of whom, as it happened, were among the seven who we have mentioned. While some of the remaining four were closely related to the one or the other of the three, no sooner did they espy the young ladies than they too were spied, whereupon Pampanea smiled and said, See how fortune favors us right from the beginning, in setting before us three young men of courage and intelligence, who will readily act as our guides and servants, if we are not too proud to accept them as for such duties. Then Nephile, whose face had turned all scarlet with confusion since she was the object of one youth's affection, said, For goodness sakes, do take care, Pampanea, of what you are saying. To my certain knowledge, nothing good can be said of any of them, and I consider them more than competent to fulfill the office of which we are speaking. I also think they would be good, honest company, not only for us, but for ladies much finer and fairer than ourselves. But since it is perfectly obvious that they are in love, and certain of ladies here present, I am apprehensive lest, by taking them with us, through no fault of their, of either of theirs, or of our own, we should bring disgrace and censure on ourselves. That is quite beside the point, said Philomena. If we live honestly, and, by, and my conscience is clear, then people may say whatever they like. God and truth will take up arms in my defense, not if only they were prepared to accompany us. We should truly be able to claim, as Pampanea has said, that fortune favors our enterprise. Philomena's words reassured the other ladies, who not only wish, withdrew their objections, but unanimously agreed to call the youth, um, the youth men over, explain their intentions, and inquire whether they would be willing to join their expedition. And so, without any further discussion, Pampanea, who was a blood relation to one of the young men, got up and walked toward them. They were standing there gazing at the young ladies, and Pampanea, having offered them a cheerful greeting, told them what they were planning to do, and asked them, on behalf of all her companions, whether they would be prepared to join them in a spirit of chaste and brotherly affection. The young men, though at first, um, thought at first that she was making mock of them, but when they realized that she was speaking in earnest, they gladly agreed to place themselves at the young lady's disposal, so that they should not be, so that there should be no delay in putting the plan into effect. They would make provisions then and there um, for the prepar for the various matters that would have to be attended to before departure. Meticulous care was taken to see that all necessary preparations were put in hand. Supplies were sent on in adv on in advance to the place where they intended to stay. And as dawn was breaking in the morning of the next day, which was Wednesday, the ladies and the three young men, accompanied by one or two of their maids and all the manservants, set out from, from the city, and scarcely had they traveled two miles from Florence before they reached the place at which they had agreed to stay. So, preparations are made. I'm sure if they had toilet paper, they stocked up. And they could travel. They don't have to travel very far. Two miles is a very small distance. They just need to get away from the other people. Social distancing. The spot in question some, was some distance away from any road on a small hill that was agreeable to behold for its abundance of shrubs and trees and all bedecked with green leaves. Perched on its summit was a palace built round a fine spacious courtyard and containing logias, halls, um, sleeping apartments, which were not only excellently proportioned, but richly embellished with paintings depicting scenes of gaiety. Um, delectable gardens and meadows lay all around, and there were wells of cool, refreshing water. The cellars were stocked with precious wines more suited to the palates of connoisseurs than to sedate and respectable ladies. And on their arrival, the company discovered 
that to their no small pleasure that the place had been clean from top to bottom. Beds in the rooms were made up. The whole house was adorned with seasonable flowers of every description, and the floors had been carpeted with rushes. If you're going to take refuge, take refuge in style. Um, soon after reaching the palace, they sat down. They all sat down, and Dionao, a youth of matchless charm and readiness and wit, said, it is not our foresight, ladies, but rather your own good sense that has led us to this spot. I know not what you intend to do with your troubles. Mine own I left inside the city gates when I departed. Thence a short while ago, in your company, um, hence you may either prepare to join with me in as much laughter, song, and merriment as, you sense, uh, as your sense of decorum will allow, or else you may give me least to go back to my, for my troubles and live in the afflicted cities. Pepinea, as though she too had driven away all her troubles, answered him in the same carefree pain. There is much sense in what you say, Danael, she replied. A merry life should be our aim, since it is, since it was for no other reason that we were prompted to run away from the sorrows of the city. However, nothing will last for very long unless it poses a definite form. And since it was I who led the discussion from which this fair company has come into being, I have given some thought to the continuance of our happiness and consider it necessary for us to choose a leader drawn from our own ranks whom we would honor and obey as our superior and whose sole concern will be that of devising the means whereby we may pass our time agreeably but so much that none of us will complain that he or she has had an has had no opportunity to experience the burden or responsibility and the pleasure of command associated with sovereign power i propose that the burden and the honor should be assigned to each of us in turn for a single day. It will be for all of us to decide who is to be the first ruler, after which it will be up to each ruler, when the hour of the Vespers approaches, to elect his or her successor from among the ladies and gentlemen present. The person chosen to govern will be at liberty to make whatever arrangements he likes for the period covered by his rule, and to prescribe the place and the manner in which we are to live. So, okay. You've gotten away from the city. You've gotten away from the disease. Now what? You're going to be there for ages. Or in this case, 10 days. Hence, deck camera. What do you do? Well, as you've probably discovered, entertainment is important when you're going through social distancing. Because you can't really be all that social, can you? So, you're going to have to work on some entertainment. Pepinea's proposal was greatly... Uh, was greatly to everyone's liking, and they unanimously elected her as their as their queen for the first day. Whereupon Philomena quickly ran over to a laurel bush, for it had frequently heard for she had frequently heard that the laurel leaves were especially worthy of veneration, and that they were they conferred great honor upon those uh, people of merit who were crowned with them. Having plucked a few of its shoots, she fashioned them into a splendid and venerable garland, which she set upon Pampinea's brow and which thenceforth became the outward symbol of sovereign power and authority to all members of the company for as long as they remained together. Um, a crown of laurels has long and ancient roots. Um, goes back a lot further than Boccaccio. Caesar had a crown of laurels, which he liked because Caesar was bald and the crown covered that up. But that gives you an idea how far back this tradition goes. Um, upon her election as the, their queen, Pompeia summoned the servants and three young men to appear before her together with their own maid servants, who were four in number. And having called upon every one to be silent, she said, so that I may begin by setting you all a good example through which proceeding from good or better, our company will be enabled to live an ordered and agreeable existence for as long as we choose to remain together. I first of all appoint Dionao's manservant, Parmino, as my steward. And to him, I commit the management and care of our household together with all the, that appertains to the service of the hall. I desire that Panfilo's servant, Sirisco, um, should act as our buyer and treasurer and carry out the instructions of Par Parmino, as well as attending to the needs of Philostrato. Um, Tindera will look after the other two gentlemen in their rooms whenever their own manservants are present prevented by their offices from performing their such duties. My own maidservants, Messia, 
will be employed full time in the kitchen along with Philomena's maidservant Lyskia. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And they will prepare with diligence whatever dishes are prescribed by Parmino. Chimera and Stratilia, the servants of Loretta and Fiametta, are required to act as chambermaids to all the ladies, as well as seeing that the places we frequently are neatly, uh, we frequent are neatly and tidily maintained. And unless we they wish to incur our royal displeasure, we desire and command that each and every one of the servants should take good care, no matter what they should hear or observe in their comings and goings, to bring us no tidings of the world outside these walls, unless they are tidings of happiness. So. We see a lot of the same stuff that we practice in social distancing today. Notice that there's only one person who goes out and buys things. Um, basically, this guy, Cerisco, um, who's the buyer and the treasurer. So he's the only person who's going to have contact with anybody outside of their retreat, thereby reducing the paths that the disease can, do, can enter. Right now, we're doing social distancing. I do all the shopping. Nobody other than me has gone to the market since um, two Fridays ago. So we see the same thing going on 800 years ago that we see now. Her orders thus summarily given and commended by all her companions, she rose gaily to her feet and said, There are gardens here and meadows and other places of great charm and beauty through which we may now wander in search of our amusement, each of us being free to do whatever he pleases. But on the stroke of thrice, or tears, or tears say, there's a footnote, there's an end note. Uh, let us all return to this spot so that we must, may take breakfast together in the shade. I believe tears say is one o'clock in the afternoon. I would have to actually look it up in the notes. And do you really want me to do that right now? I'll try to do my little better research before I start in the future. Um, the merry company having thus been dismissed by their newly elected queen, the young men and their fair companions sauntered slowly through a garden, conversing on pleasant topics, weaving fair garlands for each other from leaves of various trees and singing songs of love, basically passing time. After spending as much time there as the queen had allotted them, they returned to the house to find that Parmino had made a zealous beginning to his duties. For as they entered the hall on the ground floor, they saw tables laid, ready laid with pure white tablecloths and with goblets shining as bright as silver, whilst the whole room was decorated with broom blossoms. At the queen's behest, they rinsed their hands in water, then seated themselves in the places to which Parmino had assigned them. Dishes daintily prepared were brought in, excellent wines were at hand, and without a sound, the three manservants promptly began to wait upon them. Everyone was delighted that these things had been done so charmingly and efficiently. Arranged and during this meal afterward, af, uh, sorry, after this meal, there was pleasant talk and merry laughter from all sides. Afterwards, the tables were cleared and the queen sent for musical instruments so that one or two of their number, well-versed in music, could play and sing, whilst the rest, ladies and gentlemen alike, would dance and carol. At the queen's request, Dianeo took a lute and Fiametta a viola, and they struck up a melodious tune, whereupon the queen, having sent the servants off to eat, formed a ring of the other ladies and the two young men, and sedately began to dance. And when the dance was over, they sang a number of gay and charming little songs. In this fashion, they continued until the queen decided that the time had come for them to retire or to rest, whereupon she dismissed the whole company. The young men went away to their rooms, which were separated from those of the ladies, and found that, like the hall, they too were full of flowers, and that their beds were neatly made. The ladies made a similar discovery in theirs, and having undressed, they lay down to rest. The queen rose shortly after nones. I really need to look at what you know, what these times are, and caused the other ladies to be roused. As also young men declared it was harmful to sleep too much during the day, they therefore betook themselves to a meadow, where the grass, being protected from the heat of the sun, grew thick and green, and where, perceiving that a gentle breeze was stirring, the queen suggested that they should all sit on the green grass in a circle, and when they were seated, she addressed them as follows. As you can see, the sun is high in the sky, and it is very hot, and all is silent except for the cicadas and the olive trees. For the moment, it would surely be foolish of us to venture abroad, this being such a cool and pleasant spot in which to linger. Besides, as you will observe, there are chessboards and other games here, 
and so we are free to amuse ourselves in whatever way we please. But if you were to follow my advice, this hotter part of the day would be spent not in playing games, which inevitably bring anxiety to one of the players without offering much pleasure to either of his opponent, either to his opponent or to the spectators, but in telling stories, an activity that may afford some amusement both to the narrator and to the company at large. By the time each of, of you has narrated a little tale of his own or her own, the sun will be setting, the heat will have abated, and we shall be able to go and amuse ourselves wherever you choose. Let us then, if the idea appeals to you, carry this proposal of mine into effect, but I am willing to follow your own wishes in this matter. And if you disagree with my suggestion, let us all go and occupy our time in whatever way we please until the hour of vespers. The whole company, ladies and gentlemen alike, were in favor of telling stories. Then, if it is agreeable to you, said the queen, I desire that on the first day each of us should be free to speak upon whatever topic he prefers. And turning to Panfilio, uh, Panfilo, who was seated on her right, she graciously asked him to introduce the proceedings with one of his stories. No sooner did he receive this invita invitation than Pifilo began as follows, and everyone listening intently. And that's the first story. So the Decameron is 10 days in social isolation, wherein each of the 10 people will each tell one story. There's 100 stories in this book, which is why it's so thick. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to read any of any or all the stories I might I don't know depends if anybody actually watches the video I just made we'll see but anyway that's that have a nice morning or afternoon or whatever this is and I hope you're all well